Welcome back. This is lecture two, and this is based on the first part of chapter two of the textbook, which is sources of information. Uh, so the textbook reviews three sources of evidence for people's belief, beliefs, um, experience, intuition, and authority, and then compares them to empirical research. And so that's what I'm going to review in this lecture. Um, and, um, right, so in this lecture, I'm going to review uh, research first, uh, our experience, intuition, and then uh, trusting authorities on the subject. In a separate lecture, I'll review the rest of the chapter, which is about finding and reading research. So let's start with research versus your experience. And so according to the chapter, there are two main problems with basing our beliefs on experience. And the first is that experience has no comparison group. And the second is that experience is confounded. So I'm going to describe both of these in more detail. And then I'll also describe why research is better than experience. And also this idea that research is probabilistic. All right, so one reason that we shouldn't base our beliefs on personal experience alone is that experience has no comparison group. It's important to have a comparison group in order to form meaningful conclusions. So by definition, a comparison group is a group that is different in some intended and meaningful way from another group of interest. And it's by uh, comparing one group of interest with a comparison group and seeing how they're different uh, that we can make meaningful conclusions. So research asks the critical question, compared to what? And so I think the textbook gives a really good example demonstrating the power of using a comparison group, which I will review as well. So for decades, surgeons believed that the practice of performing a radical mastectomy was the most effective way to remove breast cancer. Um, a radical mastectomy involves the complete removal of not only the breast, but also lymph nodes, chest muscles, even the collarbone. So um, it's, a, it's a very uh, you know, brutal operation, and it can leave a patient completely um, disfigured. So, you know, for uh, kind of as extreme as that treatment is, it's very important to understand, like, well, does it actually work? So um, the, the practice was, I think, uh, popularized in the medical community, like the late 1800s, but it was so widely accepted that any, anybody that dared to question would basically be insulted. Like if you were a, a, a surgeon and you didn't believe in or perform radical mastectomies, you were basically, you know, insulted as somebody that, that didn't know how to practice uh, medicine. And so as a result of this widespread acceptance of their effectiveness in the field, alternative treatments weren't even tested until around the 1970s. Uh, when the National Cancer Institute conducted clinical trials of this radical form of mastectomies versus other treatments. So what we're looking uh, at in this particular um, figure is essentially what surgeons assumed. Okay, So starting, you know, late 1800s, really up until the 1970s, most surgeons simply assumed that radical mastectomies were the best treatment for breast cancer. However, the only data that they actually had was on their own procedure. They never collected any data on comparison treatments. In other words, they're relying on their experience without a comparison group. So you can see in this figure, um, this is essentially what was assumed, that if there was some other treatment, it would be less affected. But notice that this group didn't actually exist. It wasn't tested. No actual data was collected. They were simply relying on their experience of performing these radical mastectomies and saying, oh, it, it must work. Um, notice that there are several possible outcomes. 
So if radical mastectomies were compared to other treatments, there's three possible outcomes. If you actually went out and collected the data on, the, on say, uh, radical mastectomies versus uh, another treatment, you could have learned that the other treatments were either worse than, about the same as, or better than the surgery. So having a, a comparison group with another treatment would allow us to compare. And so that's exactly what was done um, in the 1970s. Researchers at the National Cancer in Institute conducted a um, randomized clinical trial, and we'll learn what those words mean later on in the, in the, um, uh, in the course. Uh, and so this randomized clinical trial involved nearly 1,700 women, they compared a group with um, radical mastectomy with other treatments, including a simple mastectomy and other, uh, and other um, uh, I believe, simple mastectomy plus doing radiation treatment. What they found was that the radical procedure didn't lead to better outcomes. So we can see that uh, the 25-year survival rate for the radical as well as other, other treatments, and they're about the same. So given uh, the disfigurement uh, to women with the radical approach, um, it, was, it proved no more effective. And so other treatments, like a simple mastectomy, were ultimately favored. And so today, radical mastectomy is almost never used. And what an awful shame it is to think about how many um, decades, the radical approach was the commonly accepted uh, practice in medicine. So um, I think that that's a very uh, it's a it's a it's a really great example that the the textbook um, gives. Um, and so we can kind of think about that you know similar to these surgeons that never compared the radical mastectomy with other procedures, um, when we rely on our personal experience to decide what's true we usually don't have a systematic comparison group. In, in a sense, we're only observing one patient, which is us. It's, our, it's ourselves. So our daily experiences usually lack a comparison group, and therefore it's difficult to make systematic comparisons. A little bit later on in the lecture, I'll share an example of how we would go about setting up uh, systematic comparisons, but before I do that, um, I want to review the second main issue with using our experience, um, which is that it, our experience is confounding. So in the real world, there are usually several possible explanations for some event or outcome, and these alternative explanations are called confounds. Confounded means to be confused. You, you think that it's one thing that caused the outcome, but because other things also change or co-occur co at the same time, we're confused about what the real cause is. So a confound is a general term for a potential alternative explanation to a conclusion from a research finding. Confounds undermine a researcher's ability to draw conclusions, especially about cause and effect relationships between variables. So, let's see if I have another slide. Yeah. Um, let's do an example. Um, we've got, uh, let's just say that we read in the newspaper uh, or some news article online that a study concluded that exercise has a positive effect on cognitive functioning in older adults. Okay, so the way that they studied this, or the way that they studied the effect of exercise, was that they had half of the participants attend a group exercise class, and then the other half did not. So the ones that are getting exercise are attending this group exercise class. So there's a problem. There's a problem with saying that exercise has the positive effect on cognitive functioning. The problem is that exercise is confounded with social interaction because it's a group exercise class. So the key issue here is that both the exercise and the social interaction from the group activity co-occur. 
they happen at the same time, right? So participants that don't exercise, they don't get the, they don't necessarily get the social interaction either. And so it's not possible to determine whether it's the exercise or the social interaction that's responsible for the improvement in cognitive functioning. It could be the exercise, that's one possibility, but it could be the social interaction, or it could be both. We can't disentangle the true cause and effect relationship because exercise and social interaction co-occur. They are those explanations are confounded with one another. Okay, so um, a problem with our experience is that we don't have a compare. We often don't have a comparison group to make these systematic comparisons, and oftentimes in our uh, real world everyday life. There's many things going on at once, many things co-occur, and so different explanations are confounded. It's hard to parse them apart. And so this is one reason why research is better than experience. Research is better than experience because it sets up specific comparisons and also controls for confounds. So the chapter shares the example of a 2002 study that was conducted by Brad Bushman. He examined the effect of um, venting. Okay, this is also known as uh, catharsis. This idea that if we can have this release of negative uh, emotion or energy, it'll get rid of our aggression and we'll feel better. Um, so Sigmund Freud uh, was a very you know well-known figure in psychology. He was a uh, advocate. Of catharsis, and he used it in his uh, therapy. You know, he was a big believer that if we have this uh, repressed uh, negative emotion, it builds up inside of you, and it causes uh, psychological symptoms and, and dysfunction, such as hysteria. So the idea is that um, you know, actually acting in an aggressive way is an effective way to get rid of your anger and aggression. It's the idea that, you know, if you don't, you have all that aggression that builds up inside of you. And so you need to release it by acting aggressively. Okay, so these were Freud's ideas and many other um, therapists believed it at the time and interestingly continue to believe it today. The question is, you know, does it work? If we um, vent our anger and do some of the, you know, kind of popular things that therapists suggest, like you punch a pillow you know, you imagine it's the person's face and you pound on the pillow or you hit a punching bag. Will you feel better? Does it work? Well, this is, this is what Bushman did. He conducted a study examining the effect of aggression on uh, vent, venting versus not venting the anger. Uh, participants were college undergraduates. Um, he, you know, he needed to make them angry. So what he had each of the undergraduates do was write an essay the participants were instructed to show their essays to a person named Steve, who is really a confederate of the study. A confederate is an actor who plays a specific role for the experimenter. So Steve, after reading the essay, criticized them, said they were the worst he had ever uh, read, and made rude comments. And so, you know, they, they knew that this would get people um, upset. So the participants were randomly assigned to one of three groups. So after being upset by Steve, group one was told to sit quietly in a room for two minutes. Group two was told to hit a punching bag for two minutes as a form of exercise. And group three was told to punch the punching bag for two minutes and imagine that it is Steve's face on the bag. So this is the catharsis group, okay? And this is really exactly what Freud had intended, and, and even what some advocates of this technique stress today, is that you imagine the person that angered you and you hit some, you know, object like a pillow or a punching bag. It turns out that participants were then led to believe that they were going to play a quiz game with Steve, and that they were, they had the opportunity to provide a blast of loud noise to Steve's ears when Steve made a mistake. So which group gave Steve the loudest, longest blasts of this loud noise? Well, here we have the results 
in this figure. And as you can see, it was the group, it was the catharsis group that actually, um, as an index of aggression, uh, gave Steve the, the loudest and the longest blast. Okay, so this is, they just kind of created a variable which was uh, overall aggression based on those metrics. But you can see it was actually the catharsis group that showed the most aggression which wasn't what was supposed to happen, was it? According to, to Freud, hitting that punching bag should get the aggression out. So this group should have been the less aggressive. Who was actually the least aggressive? It was the group that just sat there quietly and with the exercise group being right in the middle. Um, so what's good about this research? The first thing is that there's the systematic comparison groups is we, we can answer the question compared to what? So here's our catharsis group, and we can say, well, does catharsis work? Com well, compared to what? Catharsis doesn't appear to work at all compared to just sitting quietly. It also doesn't appear to work um, versus exercising but not thinking about the person that angered you. Confounds were also controlled for. In the study, all three groups were made to feel equally angry at first. Um, and then uh, another interesting thing that Bushman did is that he separated the effects of um, uh, exercise with um, aggression towards the, 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 the person. So what we have here is we've got, they're still hitting the punching bag, right? And so you could say, well, that's exercise, but it's not only exercise, it's thinking about the person. So is it the thinking about the person and being active, or is it just the exercise? Like those two things are confounded. So they stripped away the confound by just having the exercise only condition. So these two conditions are doing the same thing. They're both exercising. They're both hitting the punching bag, but in one condition... They're not thinking about the person that angered them, and in one condition they are. So that kind of strips away, you know, is it only the exercise or is it the exercise plus thinking about um, the person that angered you? Now, interestingly, Bushman's study is not the only one to have looked at uh, whether venting works or whether catharsis works. Um, research has repeatedly shown that people who physically express their anger at a target actually become more angry than when they started. Um, and so basically psychologists have proposed that venting out aggression kind of gives people practice at being aggress uh, aggressive. Um, so, so there is not strong research support. There really isn't any research support that I'm aware of it would suggest that catharsis or venting actually works. Now, occasionally you might hear about a research finding that contradicts your experience. And maybe what the one that I just said, that there's not much research support for the idea that venting works, that might actually contradict your own experience. Um, you know, um, and, and it might make you maybe more skeptical or less willing to accept the research findings. So if you're somebody who um, does often vent their anger and feels like it works for them, or maybe you don't do it often, but it's very easy for you to recall in your mind an instance when you did and it seemed to work, um, you know, you might kind of call into question the research results. And the reason is that our personal experiences are really powerful things. Um, I mean, there are experiences, right? Like they're the kind of the most truthful and valid things to us because they're ours. They're our experience. But we can often let um, a single experience cast doubt on the findings of more rigorous research. Um, and so, you know, you, you may even acknowledge that your experience could be an exception uh, to what the research shows. And so you might say like, okay, well, that was the trend for everybody else, but it wasn't for me. Um, and so hopefully we would acknowledge that an exception doesn't necessarily undermine the results. 
the idea here is that behavioral research is probabilistic. The findings from research are not expected to explain all cases all the time. Another way of saying this is that there are exceptions. What research conclusions are meant to explain is kind of the majority or the largest proportion of all possible cases. Okay, research su suggests what is typical, what happens on, on average, um, that there's a strong probability that something is true, but there is, of course, no guarantee. And so just as another example of this idea of research being probabilistic, um, this is a gra uh, graph, I actually swiped this from a news article um, on the internet showing the relationship between household income and happiness. So, you know, let's just say you read this news article about the relationship between money and happiness. Like this article cites some research, finds that there's a positive relationship or a positive correlation between household income and happiness, such that in general, the higher uh, the, the household income, the happier people report that they are. Um, well, you might remember this from a statistics class. We've got a scatter plot of data. Each one of those points represents somebody's uh, uh, income as well as their level of happiness. So you can just think of one person that reports their household income as well as how happy they are. So what we can see here is that there is a general trend such that in general, higher income is associated with higher happiness lower income associated with lower, lower happiness. But, you know, you might be this data point here, right? You might say, well, I don't make a lot of money and I'm perfectly happy. And so, you know, that might, you might call into question the results and say, no, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe that there's an association between income and happiness because this is me. This is me right here. I don't make a lot of money. I'm perfectly happy. Again, going back to the idea that research is probabilistic. It's not meant to explain every case. And in fact, in this scatter plot, this scatter plot, these are all real data points. This person doesn't, doesn't fit the trend. Okay? They're an exception to the rule. So, so there um, are almost always exceptions to the rule. But hopefully, if we're that exception to the rule and we'll say and we say, no, that doesn't apply to me, we can at least acknowledge, okay, but well, look at all these other people, right? Like, it's it's not my experience, but the pattern does seem to be among everybody else that it is their experience, okay? And I think that the opposite is true as well. So just as we wouldn't want to kind of try to invalidate um, uh, a set of research findings because it didn't apply to us, it's also important to acknowledge that if we would find ourselves kind of smack dab on that trend line, and say, yes, exactly, I make a lot of money and I'm happy, and so I expect that that would be true for everybody, we could also acknowledge that there's exceptions to the rule. So research is probabilistic, and it's not deterministic, right? A research finding doesn't determine what is going to be true of everybody. It means that, you know, we have to acknowledge that there's exceptions. All right, so I said I was going to come back to an example of kind of setting up um, systematic comparisons based on our experience. So let's do this example. Imagine that as a parent, you've observed that when you take away your child's electronics, your child is better behaved. The question would be, is it possible to conclude that removing the electronics is the cause of the better behavior? What we need to ask are two questions. Compared to what, and what are the possible confounds? So in order to address this compared to what, and, and, and in order to conclude that removing the electronics is the cause of better behavior, the first step is to set up systematic comparisons. Okay, so it might look something like this. The comparison is we've got taking away the electronics. You can kind of think of this as this is, you know, my parental intervention, okay? The status quo is that, you know, the child gets to play on the electronics. I just let them have it. They do whatever. 
Okay. So the, that, those are the two comparisons, either when I engage in my parental intervention and I take away the electronics or I let the child keep the electronics. And then what we're looking for would be instances of when the child is well-behaved versus not well-behaved. And so uh, you, you kind of would need to think about what would be the data or the evidence that a parent would need to see an association between electronic use and good and bad behavior, and what would you expect to see in the four cells of this research design? What I would expect to see is that if there's evidence that would support a kind of cause and effect relationship, I would expect that when I take away the electronics, my child is well behaved, but when I uh, uh, allowed the kid to keep the electronics, they're not well behaved. So I would see like a lot of um, instances or situations in which I have a well behaved child after taking away the electronics and a not well behaved child when I let them keep the electronics. And I wouldn't see observations in these two boxes of the design. So that would be first. That's the first thing is setting up systematic comparisons. But that's not the only step. The next step is to identify possible confounds. So it could be the case, let's just say if a parent takes the electronics away and their child starts behaving better, is it necessarily the electronics or could it be something else? We have to ask ourselves what other factors could be confounded as in co-occur with allowing the uh, with allowing one's child to use or not use the electronics. So it's thinking about possible confounds. So one thing that could be happening is that, let's go back to the uh, design here, is that when the parent takes away the electronics, maybe something else is happening at the same time. As in, let's put down the phone, let's play a game together or put down the phone, I'm going to give you some attention, like we're going to talk. So it's not just the taking away of the electronics, but it is something else that happens. They get more attention, um, etc. So if that happens, right, and you have to address whether that is actually something that happens, we have a confound. We don't know whether it's the removal of the electronics or the addition of parental attention. So we need to address those kind of um, alternative explanations, those confounds. But that would be the way that we go about doing it, which admittedly seems like a lot of work, doesn't it? So that's why we kind of can rely, hopefully rely on the, on the research. But if we were to do this in our own lives, we would really want to think critically and think about um, what happens when I keep the electronics, what happens when I take away the electronics, uh, if when I take away the electronics, am I introducing some of the confound? So we, we can start to think about these types of examples based on our own experience in a little bit more of a, a research-based or scientific way, we could say. All right. So turning to uh, comparing the research versus our intuition. So I'm going to go over uh, ways in which intuition is biased, and then the, bo the book makes the point about uh, being an intuitive thinker versus a scientific uh, reasoner. So uh, our intuition is biased in um, five different ways, and I'll go over um, each of these. So one is that we're, we're very swayed, as in very convinced by a good story. Sometimes we accept a conclusion be because, just because it sounds good or it makes sense, even if that story is false. So for instance, catharsis seems reasonable. It seems like a good story. Like, hey, if I got to go in one of those smash rooms and bust up a lot of stuff, you know, and I'm kind of thinking about my boss that I hate, you know, I, I feel better. Like that kind of seems true to me. It just, it's like, I believe it. It's a good story. Um, it, it just, you know, and, and alternatively, it just also seems sensible that um, bottling up negative emotions uh, seems unhealthy. And so that was Freud's idea, right? It sounds, and at the time, um, uh, 
Freud was very influenced by industrial technology and even um, like steam engines that used, you know, compressed steam to, to, um, um, to, to power the machine. So it was like this hydraulic, not hydraulic, but kind of this um, uh, steam powered metaphor. People were like, oh, that makes sense. Like people are kind of like that too. It was just, it made sense at the time. It was a good story. Um, so um, we just, we're, stri- we're swayed by a good story. Another way that our intuition is biased is that we are often persuaded by what easily comes to mind. Um, So the availability heuristic states that things that come to mind easily are more available to memory and can therefore guide and or bias our thinking. And this is especially true of memories that are very recent or very um, vivid and salient. So... Uh, so again, uh, the availability heuristic, it's this mental shortcut where people use, uh, make a judgment based on the ease to which they can bring something to mind. And the trouble is that sometimes what is easiest to remember is not necessarily true. And so uh, the example that I have in the picture here is that um, we might think that shark attacks are common because it's very like vivid. It's a very easy kind of thing to um, imagine. And when it happens, they show up on the news. I remember seeing one this, this past summer. But in fact, they're extremely rare. Uh, I believe this statistic, this is uh, something like being killed by a shark is like uh, the chances of one in 3.7 million. Um, and that's, you're much, much less likely to be killed by a shark in a shark attack than uh, for instance, um, dying or drowning in a bathtub, which is like one in 800,000. But death by shark attack is very memorable. It's very vivid. I even said like, oh, I remember hearing a report on the news. It was on the East Coast. There was a shark attack. Um, so it just comes to mind much more easily. And that kind of biases our judgment about the likelihood of, say, being you know, killed in a shark attack versus something that is much more common, you know, like dying, this is kind of grim, I understand, dying in a bathtub versus, um, you know, the more salient cause. Um, all right, so our, our intuition is biased by being persuaded by what easily comes to mind. Um, so present, all right, present, uh, present absent bias. I'm sorry, present, present bias, present, present bias. Um, Great example from the textbook. I just love it. Uh, Have you ever found yourself thinking about an old friend and then you get a text message from them? And then you're like, I must be psychic. I was just thinking about that person. And then I got the text message. Well, you're not psychic. This is an example of the present, present bias. What you've done is notice the times when your thoughts coincided with the text message and concluded there must be something there. But we forget to consider all the times that you might have thought about people who then subsequently didn't text you, or all the times that people did text you when you weren't thinking about them. So we forget to think about and even seek out the negative information. So the present present bias states that we noticed what we notice what is present and we thus fail to look for the absences. So thinking about the example from before, if I was to conclude, hey, you know, every time I take away the electronics, my child seems so well behaved. The present present bias suggests that we focus only on this this box, this cell in the design. Because the intervention is present, right? That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm kind of engaging in this intervention of taking away the electronics. So I'm doing the intervention. That's there. That's present. And then I'm focusing on when the outcome is present. So we're putting all of our attention here and we're focusing less on the other three outcomes. So we're not looking for kind of what would be contradictory information because either the outcome isn't present or, you know, when we, when 
we let the kid keep the electronics, nothing is done. No intervention is present. So we're kind of not, we're less focused on that. So that's what the present present bias says is that we're very focused on, you know, we notice what is present and we thus fail to look for uh, data or information that would be, um, you know, not present. Okay. Um, another way that our intuition is biased is that we focus on information that we like the best. And this is known as confirmation bias. It's the tendency to look only at information that agrees with what we already believe. So that is we cherry pick the information that we take in. We like to seek and accept only evidence that supports what we already think. And so one kind of well-known example of this is the news programming that people watch, um, you know, people that have a particular um, political orientation choose to watch one news channel versus the other. And those news channels, knowing that they have a particular uh, target audience, will present information that they know aligns with their audience's political views. So this ends up being a lot of confirmation bias because we go to the news sources that we know will confirm the things that we already believe. Um, and the, uh, the textbook gave a really great example about um, a research example of uh, uh, giving people um, an IQ test, which is uh, one you should take a look at as well. Good example of that. Couple things that I'll add about confirmation bias. Um, so numerous research studies show that people evaluate preference consistent information differently than preference inconsistent information. Specifically, they judge preference, cons preference consistent information to be more credible and important, right? So when I encounter things in the world that are consistent with what I believe, my preferences, I judge them to be more credible and important. Alternatively, preference inconsistent information is more likely to be disregarded. Well, that doesn't agree with me. I disregard it. Confirmation bias influences how we interact with others. So studies of group decision making show that people are more likely to mention and repeat information that supports their initial preference when in a group decision making or problem solving situation which is kind of, it completely defeats the purpose, doesn't it? The reason that we get people together is that we have different points of view, kind of a, a difference of opinion. And the idea is that if we can share all of our information and talk things out, we should be able to make kind of the best, most informed decisions. Well, that means that people kind of have to be willing <laughs> to listen to others um, and go in with an open mind. But what, what do people, what does research show that people do? They end up, you know, mentioning and repeating only the information that supports their initial preference. Okay, and there could be strategic reasons for this. They want to win the argument um, or, you know, think that, you know, they're kind of being an advocate for their own position. Um, but there can be some kind of ironic effects of confirmation bias playing out when we're in a, um, uh, a group decision situation is that we don't often end up taking advantage of uh, um, kind of that, that situation, being able to learn from one another in the process. Okay, um, and then uh, kind of a final way that our intuition is biased is that we're biased about being biased. We have a bias blind spot. This is the belief that we're unlikely to have the same biases that other people do that are previously described. So, oh yeah, other people, you know, they have that availability heuristic and they're kind of very e easily influenced by, by what comes to mind. Other people do that, not me. Oh, confirmation bias. Oh, I can tell you all the people I know that all they are, they just are confirmation bias all the time. Not me though. So that would be a bias blind spot. Um, and so in the, in the text, they, I, will, I will kind of go over this one. Um, they cite a study in which researchers interviewed uh, people at the airport, um, most of whom said that the average American is much more biased than they were themselves. Um, so they said that 
while most other people would take credit for their personal success, they wouldn't, um, that, you know, other Americans would say that just because a person is smart and competent, uh, just because they're nice, well, I wouldn't believe that. Um, or that, you know, other Americans tend to blame victims for random violence or, you know, it's their fault. They're in the wrong place at the wrong time, but I wouldn't do that. So, um, the idea here and what that is meant to illustrate is that many people have a bias blind spot. And so, um, this is kind of the issue with being an intuitive thinker versus a kind of a scientist is that what a scientist tries to do is, uh, understand that intuition is bias, biased and to therefore be more objective and do some of the things like setting up, uh, systematic comparisons, thinking about confounds, et cetera. The last point I'll make is, and uh, the textbook talks about trusting authorities. Um, so pictured here are just a couple celebrities that have made public statements against mandatory vaccinations for children, like measles, mumps, rubella, et cetera, um, uh, often kind of... Um, stating the belief that uh, vaccines uh, lead to autism, and so we, we shouldn't do it. Um, that is very inconsistent with the actual research evidence on the topic. There is no research evidence, no credible research evidence that vaccination leads to autism. Um, you can actually trace that back to an article that was uh, published in a medical journal, very unfortunate thing. Um, uh, not a well-done study, highly problematic. I think there was like seven children in it or 17 children. Like the sample size was tiny. Um, the, the, the article was subsequently retracted from the journal. But that one article has led to this widespread belief that vaccines are related to autism. And then it gets out and celebs get a hold of it. And then they, they go on the public record. And, and some people trust them. They trust celebrities as being authorities on the matter. Um, I, Jessica Beale, in fact, even went to uh, Sacramento to try to uh, lobby our state uh, lawmakers against mandatory uh, vaccinations. So, um, so, you know, while many people would say like, oh, well, you know, who believes um, celebrities? I don't. That's kind of one example of trusting authorities. But there's many people that are authorities, or at least would have the credentials to appear to be authorities on the matter, um, and, it, and it can become more difficult. So the textbook gives an example of um, getting anger management advice, okay, about venting and catharsis uh, from a person who has a master's degree in psychology, has published several books on anger management, uh, has a workshop business that is all about, you know, catharsis and, and venting, you know, has her own website, the whole thing. You know, this looks like a credible person. Advanced degree, published books, etc. And so this person kind of gives the the Freudian advice. Hit the pillow, yell, curse. Imagine the person's face. You have to exercise this person out of you. That's the only way you're going to be rid of this anger, right? So there's, there's, you know, real therapists out there in the world that have all the credentials that still espouse this belief that catharsis works. And the thing is, that could be very true based on their experience. If all they do is they they run these workshops, people hit the, the pillow, and they say, hey, how'd you feel after hitting that pillow? Well, I feel much better, okay? They probably believe that it's true, but they haven't necessarily read the research. They haven't set up the systematic comparisons. It's just kind of like the surgeons with the rad radical mastectomies, okay? So it can be difficult, I think, often as a student to um, kind of acknowledge that there are people that have degrees, have credentials, write books, um, that, that have all the makings of a bona fide authority or expert, and the wisdom that they're espousing may or may not be true. It doesn't mean that it's wrong, it just means that we should still take a, a kind of a healthy amount of, of skepticism. So, all right, that's it for this lecture. Um, 
hope you enjoyed it and that you know just a little bit more, can think just a little bit uh, critically about how we know the things that we know uh, and some of the issues, some of the potential issues with relying on our own experience, relying on our intuition, or trusting authorities too much. Thanks for listening.